Welcome to the Black Sparrow Media Internet Broadcast Network. Listening to Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a podcast about Linux, open source, and amateur radio for everyone. Now, here are your hosts Russ, K5TUX, Cheryl, W5MOO, and Bill, NE4RD. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. You have tuned into episode number 499 of Linux in the Handshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. This is the 102nd edition of The Weekend Earth, so thanks for tuning in. And as you may or may not know at this point, The Weekender is our weekly excursion, our tri weekly. Is that, is that a thing? Tri weekly? <laughs> excursion into uh, hedonism, but we also try and have a little bit of educational content, or maybe we won't. Maybe it'll be all hedonism. We don't know, but we'll get into food and booze and all the things that make life worth living towards the end, and we'll have our random segment coming up first. But before we get into that, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD. All right, so the gang is all here. Fantastic. So the first thing we have to do to get into the show tonight is head over to the Random Picker Wheel, which is a site on the Internet you can find by Googling it. And I've got a bunch of topics in there. Can't remember how many there are at this point. I think it's about 20. Some of them are amateur radio related. Some of them are Linux and open source related. Some of them are hedonism related. And we're going to try and do our best to talk for 10 to 15 minutes about whatever it is that the thing picks. So I'm going to push the button and we'll find out what we're yakking about tonight and look no audio this time i have to plug it in <laughs> but there we go <clears throat> so okay well this is one we can tackle we've talked about this before but maybe we can uh, create a succinct and uh, go-to buyer's guide for the best budget amateur radio antenna <laughs> for what <laughs> well that's i guess we'll have to, cl to clarify and classify so maybe oh, for for VHF and up, for HF, and for mm, special modes. How about that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also like uh, purpose, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. With an antenna, you know, you, you know, the mode might dictate exactly what you need to buy. Because, like, if you're a VHF and up, and you want to do well, you want to do all mode. You know, that includes single sideband and CW. You probably want something more horizontally polarized <laughs> well right yes and not necessarily a vertical or something like that um yeah mm, yeah this is could be a broad topic well okay fair enough i mean and obviously we're going to be limited to our scope of experience as well so you know because i haven't tried every antenna out there but <clears throat> i know you have tried a great many of them and i know you experiment with a bunch of them you've tried like I know everything I can think of with like, you know, end fed half waves and, you know, cubicle quads. And you've probably mm -hmm. done like bazookas and I, I don't know what else <laughs> there is out there, but <laughs> there are all different kinds of antennas. So we might have to lean on you a little bit because I have basically had the same inverted V dipole for as long as I've been on HF. And then for, for VHF and UHF, I pretty much stick to the verticals because I only operate pretty much FM. I haven't done a lot of you know, VHF and UHF simplex or anything like that. And I've definitely not explored the world of circular polarization and uh, satellites and things like that. So I don't know. We're, we're just having to wing it, but that's that's what this is all about is winging it. So, well, let's let's start like on the high bands and work our way down. OK, that and Stacey, Stacey comments sense. and says, how many times will we hear almost every antenna is a compromise? Yeah, yeah, pretty yes. much. So. Yes. <laughs> Unless you we have know a very, very specific uh, <laughs> application, then yeah. But all right. So you said you wanted to work on the high bands and work down. So so start there. So, yeah, I guess we'll start at like uh, more obtainium bands for most people, which would be 70 centimeters. So I don't think we need to go much higher than that because it's a whole different world once you get up there. And I, I really couldn't provide good answers or good good you know budget antennas and stuff like that for that area uh although i i have inherited a lot of random 
<laughs> like 1.2 gig, 900 megahertz and stuff like that over the years that I've never used and had to subsequently get rid of. <laughs> so I have no experience with that stuff. But uh, yeah, 70 centimeters. Geez. Uh, yeah. If you're just doing FM work, any any vertical, you know, even a mag mount will work to do 99.9999% of everything. Even uh, our good friend uh, Neil was talking about how he uses his little dual band vertical mounted on the car to do satellite work when the conditions are right. You know, not when it's an overhead pass, but when it's more of a, you know, on the horizon kind of pass where it makes sense to use a vertical that allows him to to do those passes. So I think the most versatile and cheapest antenna would be whatever you can afford to magnetically attach to your car uh, to start with. Um, uh, gosh, for the house, uh, I have it just a J-Pole. Uh, not a homemade one. I actually have the Aero brand J pole, and I, I've been happy with that. It doesn't have any any spectacular gain on it, and everything else. It's not a fancy antenna. I used to stick by uh, the Cushcraft uh, verticals. What were those called? Uh, Ringo Rangers. Oh, the old Ringo Ranger. Yeah, I used to have one of those. Yeah. But I was using it on eleven meters, not ten. So. <laughs> I know you should have used Antron 99 on that. Oh, the Antron 99. Yes, right. Thanks for correcting me. Yeah, the Antron 99 (laughs) was like the go-to. Although uh, when I had mine, I was up in uh, northern Maine, an area where there were no trees, basically. So one one caveat, if you ever find one of those and you want to buy one, is if it's been in a place where it's really windy, it will basically shred the outer fiberglass covering. And if you ever have to handle them, it will shred you. So yeah, gloves. never, ever, <laughs> ever touch a freaking fiberglass antenna that's been up for any amount of time <laughs> with your hands. You will, you will pay dearly for it, especially the Antrons. Those are horrible for that. They're really just kind of, yeah, just splintered you to all heck and stuff like that. But that's in 10 meter at land. So we won't talk about that quite yet. Um, yeah, if you're looking for something directional, something that you could flip horizontal, um, yeah, my preference would be a quad, although. I don't know. I don't know what the cool kids are using. I do have a an EA antenna dual band uh, that I that I will be using for horizontal use, um, but I I can't comment on that because I don't use it yet. I, I it's still in the box, like most of the things I own. <laughs> but yeah, I have used quads in the past, and uh, I've always I've always liked quad. Um, and you can make your own, and I've made I've made my own quads. I've bought quads. Um, Especially if you have a rota- you know, rotor and you're going to turn it and it's going to be up on the tower, you know, buy something with some elements on it. Um, brand, I don't, I, you know, I, I guess there's Cubex quad if you enter those quads. Um, if you're just looking for a horizontal or a vertical one, you could flip either way. You know, none of them are horrible. So I, I don't even know what would be the most practical one to get or not get. So, we definitely you know. want to be paying attention to like the gain characteristics as well. I mean, they're published for each antenna. You want right. to try and maximize that. And you also want to try and get as close to, you know, you want to keep your SWRs down and that's not with a tuner. You want your stuff to be uh, radiating as efficiently as possible. There it is. I mean, you already said it. It's a compromise, right? You can't compromise your antenna by having it, uh, <laughs> having a tuner go to it. <laughs> exactly. That's probably the biggest compromise of all is having a tuner because it. Yes, you'll get your match right, but your power output, your ERP will go yeah. way, way down. So yeah, VHF and up, you you want you don't want to be tuning antennas. They, I mean, you, you don't want to have to put a tuner, which I don't even know if there is tuners. I'm available not sure for there that. is six meter and down, but not, but not above. Yeah, it's important to tune your antenna so that it's a perfect match for what you want to use it. Now, if you're using one for sideband and for FM, that might be a problem because sideband is at you know one forty four two. Uh, and whatever for, I, I don't think on 70 centimeters is the biggest issue because I think they're more broad banded, uh, on the 70 centimeter side. So you can, well, those are four, four, at 432 is what the satellites and stuff run. Yeah. They're way down at the bottom of yeah. the band. Yeah. Yeah. So you might have an issue getting both ends tuned and you might want to do like a specifically set up. It won't be the cheapest to do that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know, man. There's, <laughs> it's hard to say. Start with a vertical mag mount and call it good, <laughs> or a J pole that you can make at your club. Because uh, I know lots of clubs build those J poles out of the 450 ohm ladder line and and some other projects like that. And those are fine. You can build a little collinear 
uh, home built as well. That works really well on two meters and on 440. Um, yeah. Antennas are just, they can get so complex. Let's move to six meters. Cause all right. right. All right. So we've hit VHF and UHF. Now we're going to move to the top of HF and work down. So six meters, anything that resonates <laughs> <laughs> because when the bands open, it doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. You could have a vertical, you could have a horizontal. Um, my preference is a squalo. I actually have a, a square antenna that's horizontally, uh, and, and whatever you call it, omnidirectional and horizontally polarized. And that works fine, you know, in my area. Um, if you want to work six meters when, when the bands aren't great, then that's when you throw some money at it and buy some elements and a tuner or you know, not a tuner, but a rotator and everything else. Um, I've done a lot of, uh, six meter contacts just off of the six meter wire that's on my HF9V vertical, my HF vertical, which I know sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely not the greatest thing, but you know, when the bands open, it doesn't matter. It really, it really doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it's, I've just, had that. it's just one of those characteristics with six meters. It doesn't matter. I and mean, Russ is running with a pair of, uh, hamsticks, right? Yeah. I have the MFJ hamstick dipole, which is literally just a horizontally mounted, uh, hamsticks on top of a 20 foot tall mast. And I've worked and I use my, my inverted V dipole too, which is actually an 80 through 10 dipole. It's not even four, six. Um, but like you say, when the band is open, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. It's just one of the weird things about six meters. It just, it, it doesn't, it's, that's why it's called the magic band because it, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Do whatever. Um, yeah. And that's a great band also just to kind of experiment with little antennas. Cause you know, when it's open, your antenna will probably still work. <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, wow, I built this thing. It's really cool and it works fine. And it only cost me like 10 cents. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's just one of those weird, weird situations. You know, ten, we're going to get down into 10 meters now. It's interesting. I just wanted to comment that I noticed the other night when I had my FT8 uh, waterfall up that 10 meters was open until like 11 at night. I mean, it's like, I, I can remember when I first got into amateur radio in the early nineties, I never worked 10 meters cause there was no 10 meters to work. <laughs> and now it's like six meters, but open all the time. It's like, you can, yeah, yeah you can barely stub your toe and not work 10 meters. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's really weird. If you, if you do like, you know, do some FT8 monitoring and stuff like that on 10 meters, you will see those random openings, even when there's diminished conditions, uh, at night, just cause it is a weird band as well. It also gets affected by E skip, which is what propagates, um, you know, six meters. So when there's clouds that are a little bit better, <laughs> better location for that for 10 meters, you know, for that frequency, um, yeah, you do get a little bit of enhanced propagation that, uh, as just amazing, you know, I remember working, you know, even from up here, I've worked, uh, VKs at like 10 30, 11 o'clock at night on 10 meters, just randomly. All of a sudden I heard some noise on the, on the radio. I had the volume up and I'm like, is something on 10 meters? <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was like, oh yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's 8,000 miles away. So, uh, it, it happens. It does happen. And, uh, yeah, intense for, well, 10 and down to HF, I guess. Well, I guess most of them are going to be similar. Um, any dipole, even compromise dipoles. Yes. Compromise, Stacy. <laughs> they, they all will work to some extent. Uh, the amount of compromise will affect both your receive performance and your transmit performance. So if you're starting out and you're doing uh, QRP work, yeah, don't, don't mess around with too many compromised antennas because <laughs> you would just be a sad panda. Because you'll, you know, you'll say, oh, I hear them fine, but then they don't hear me. And well, that's because your signal's being chewed up by the efficiency of the antenna. Um, but yeah, any, any dipole, fan dipoles work, uh, as long as they're, you know, you can fit them on your lot. You know, that's pretty much up to 20 meters. Most people can get away with tucking a dipole in most locations that nobody can see. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, they have to be up a little bit in the air, but they don't have to be up that high. I, I have a guy down the street that uh, I think the very top of the dipole is probably uh, about 10 foot above his fence. So like 16 foot up <laughs> and the ends of it are dangled on the top of his uh, fence and he works all over the place. So uh, it's possible to do just fine. 
It does affect the like the launch angle and stuff, though. If it's- yeah, your pattern is going to get slightly weird. Yeah, you'll get more stuff, you know, going straight up in the air. That's what they call cloud burning or envis, uh, where you bring that antenna, the radiator is really close to the ground, and you create uh, basically a, a vertical line straight up and down. It's really cool if you want to work like in-state contacts on a band that you normally can't. A uh, pair of invis on both sides, you can do those kind of weird short skip stuff because you're basically just shooting up and expecting a reflection back. Oh, sorry, I had to take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say, I just want to say to the thing you were talking about, about random 10 meter propagation. Sometimes, sometimes you'll actually get that like on your VHF, uh, FM thing. Like you'll be scanning around on your, your two meter rig or whatever. And suddenly you'll hear a repeater that's, 600 miles away and you'd be like oh what <laughs> yeah that's generally tropospheric ducting so that's that's fairly common there are some great websites that track that uh that type of propagation um so uh, yeah if you're interested in doing vhf work tropospheric ducting is kind of the the magic sauce for that i've i've worked from naples florida which is all the way in the south of florida pretty much as far south as you can go on the west coast before you have to go over to miami and I've worked into Ohio on two meters through tropospheric ducting, which is a lot of miles. It is a lot of miles. <laughs> and we're not really talking about propagation, but, you know, sometimes I mean, this is just on your normal, you know, vertical two meter FM antenna or whatever. It will sometimes happen. But yeah, the atmosphere is a funny thing. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that always changes the effective use of your antenna because like you can get some conditions and stuff like that out of a very modest setup. Uh, just because you're in the right place at the right time and tuned into the right frequency. So I, when I first got into the, doing HF and wanted to put an antenna up, the, the thing I heard the most was for good propagation and for good, you know, getting out to, to folks and being able to hear the way to go was to have a horizontally polarized antenna or one that was sort of, you know, like the inverted V is not fully horizontal, but it's more horizontal than vertical, for example. And then later on, Everyone was saying, oh, if you want to have good DX, you know, you have to have a vertical, you know, you have to have like a butternut, uh, you know, multiband vertical, something like that. So obviously when, when things are propagating through the atmosphere, the, the polarization gets all, you know, jacked up and you never really know which way it's going to come at you. But do you have a thought on which one is the better one to use? Well, uh, in general, um, and I'm probably, I mean, hopefully we'll get comments that say I'm completely wrong, but if. For 20 meters and up, so 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10, horizontal is probably your best approach uh, to uh, control noise and everything else because you can get that horizontal antenna, you know, at a decent height to actually get decent propagation, a decent launch patterns off of it and stuff like that. But as soon as you get into 30 and 40, you want to kind of switch to a vertical because it's pretty unideal to have your horizontal antenna at the appropriate height it needs to be to actually function properly and uh, respectfully so like that's kind of the 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 drawing line where you're kind of like well yeah it it likes if you want dx now if you're just doing stateside contacts it doesn't matter you know you'll, you'll be fine with the horizontal at Pretty much, you know, I'm not going to say any any height, but <laughs> the rule of thumb that I've always learned that seems to always kind of hold still is that, yeah, horizontal is, is fine because it's pretty obtainium, obtainable for most people to mount an antenna at the appropriate height. Because I think what for 20 meters, it's only got to be, you know, basically about 16 foot off the ground for an effective pattern. Um, you know, it would be great if it's twice as high as that, obviously, like 30 feet. What's the the rule of thumb is what half half wavelength above the ground? Yeah, yeah, generally a half wavelength above the ground. Um, yeah, to get like the, the stated patterns are generally well, most of the patterns are generated in free airspace. So <laughs> just even take into account that your antenna is not mounted where it should be, and yes, it would be a compromise. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like a perfect ideal setup would be one of those cobwebs, you know, that do twenty and up. Uh, if you want horizontal pattern, you don't want to spin anything. Um, obviously, if you have a dipole, you do get nulls on the end, so you're not going to hear in two directions very well or diminished um, reception and, and also transmission. So something more omnidirectional would be ideal um, for the cost even. I don't think uh, MFJ has the 300-watt version for, I don't know, it's less than 300 bucks or something like that. So, yeah, it's not bad. Um 
and then a vertical yeah i mean like we we just built our own verticals for 40 and uh 30 and that always worked really well um yeah yeah stacy says the cobweb works surprisingly well for what it is and it basically it, it's i believe it's a folded dipole on every band if i remember correctly on the what the original cobweb design actually is um so i mean a folded dipole we know is not very effective but you know in terms of you know comparison to a regular you know dipole but in this particular configuration it has some kind of you know almost loop loop like uh you know things that come along with it because it's a little bit quieter so you don't have as much noise coming in on it so that signal and noise kind of kind of picks up a little bit because that noise level goes way down yeah and it's mostly it does have slight null but you know it's almost imperceivable and stuff like that so put it you know pointing somewhere that you don't really care about <laughs> the back of the antenna <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, but a squalo is the same way. Uh, it's you know, it's it's a mostly omnidirectional and uh, generally is, is fine because you know those edge cases where the pattern's not quite as perfect, it's it's probably still fine. Um, yeah, verticals for everything else. Uh, you know, obviously until you can no longer make a vertical like one hundred and sixty because it's top band, you end up throwing a lot of coil or a lot of something at it that um, yeah reduces the ability for the antenna to perform really well although i've seen plenty of ground mounted 160 antennas that are compromised designs that work plenty fine for uh doing least stateside contacts and stuff like that um most people can't hang a 260 foot <laughs> horizontal dipole that a you know what how high does it have to be for 160 probably 100 and some odd feet in the air <laughs> so to be an effective uh you know horizontal yeah you can use like bazooka antennas and stuff like that and you know yeah I don't know. I don't know. I, I I would just go with a vertical. That's that's just my opinion. Well, you also have to keep in mind that as the frequency goes down, the wavelength goes up, which means the the bandedness. In other words, how how wide a band the rate the antenna is effective on gets smaller. Yes. So um, yes. so like a ten meter antenna can cover a fairly broad frequency range without becoming inefficient. A top band antenna gets really inefficient really quickly <laughs> yeah Outside generally they're its... only about 25 to 45 kc wide um tuning notch so yeah yeah most people would set it to wherever they need to be fortunately the, the 160 in the u.s at least for contesting and stuff like that seems to all be in one area so it's probably because most people tune their antenna for that area <laughs> for doing dx and stuff like that so <laughs> or of course now it's probably all ft8 right but, um but yeah so yeah, let's uh, know, let's try and distill this together. down. Maybe yeah. <laughs> let's go like for for VHF UHF for the top of the HF and then the bottom of the HF. What what would your recommendation recommendation be for like the best kind of antenna to get if you can only have one? Yeah, um, yeah, I would definitely do some kind of low band vertical that has all the lower bands uh, for HF for twenty and up. I would I would probably say cobweb or fan dipole. Um, something like that would be the best way to kind of go. That's if you're not, you know, like, oh, I can go buy me a dream beam or something like that. That's not really realistic for most people. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I would say, yeah, that for HF would probably be your most modest setup. Um, uh, the, uh, six meters again, anything, uh, I use a squalo. Squalo is probably fine. You can find them pretty cheap at Hamfest, probably fifty dollars or less. And it, it will be an antenna that it's just it's just it's so simple in design. It just works. And yeah, as long as you're just there for the openings and stuff, it'll be perfect for you. Uh, if you want to do a six meter FM, then you know maybe get a multi band mag mount vertical or something like that. Uh, most not, not a lot of people do six meters FM, but there is some interesting uh, repeaters in some areas and some interesting propagation on six meter FM. Um, but I would say that's probably a much lower usage than uh, uh, sideband and CW and uh, FD8 for six meters. Two meters and up, um, you know, vertical J-pole, you know, the arrow J-pole is a great little J-pole. Uh, Ringo Ranger, again, dual band, the 270 or whatever. Um, that'll cover most of your bases. And, you know, when you get into the weird propagation modes, then, yeah, you're you're into something that's just not normal anyway. Well, I'm not going to disagree with any of that because... I don't have enough experience with antennas. I really have a, a real limited sort of array of antennas and I've only used what I've used. I've always wanted to go and, you know, build some stuff and, and try some new things, but never really got around to it. 
So, you know, when it comes to the two meter verticals, I mean, I've, I've tried many things. I, I tend to stick to a couple of big names when it comes to those, uh, specifically Comet and Diamond. Um, but almost anything should work. And, uh, I don't know. Well, the other stuff, like I said, I've had one antenna my whole ham career. So, <laughs> yeah, all I know is from my career of ham radio is that you don't ever, don't ever get a fiberglass VHF antenna. <laughs> or two meters and up specifically they are lightning rods and when they explode they explode everywhere <laughs> uh, more more love for cobwebs yes I'm, i've been hearing a lot about cobwebs and and uh, egg beaters um lately yeah egg beaters are yeah i guess some people would argue that egg beaters are not great but then you know they're okay you know, QF, you know, quadrophilix, quadrohelix, quadrophilor helix. I don't know. QF, QFH. I think that's what they're called. QFH antennas. <laughs> like those, you can build at your house as well. And those work fairly well for satellites. Um, yeah. And uh, they're pretty, they're not too complicated to make. All right. I, th I think we've done more than enough on that topic. I mean, it's, it's one that you really have to kind of explore on your own, decide what you are going to do with the hobby, which bands you're going to be on, which modes you want to use, and uh, then find the best antenna for that application. But I think we have a good subset of uh, choices to choose from. But I mean, if you're going to be doing satellite work, you're obviously going to want to look at you know, a different kind of antenna than just your, you know, contacting your repeaters or doing 20 meters on FT8 or whatever. So um, it's probably the most expansive and, you know, complex topic in the hobby because it is the core of any, you know, operator's toolkit is is your antenna and how efficient you can make it and, and so on and so forth. So big topic and, you know, 15 or 20 minutes of us... Uh, yeah, Three speaking hours later, semi intelligently <laughs> about it is not really going to help, but hopefully that was, uh, you know, at least mildly interesting and mildly helpful. So, all right. Well, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and move on from our random topic for tonight and hit some hedonism. Let's get into some food and some booze and stuff. And, uh, we always start with food because, you know, we're human and we all got to eat. So this is where we bring Cheryl in and she's going to talk about, well, it looks like dessert tonight. So we're going straight to dessert. And, uh, I've been told that if you want to live life appropriately, eat dessert first. So of course. And especially because pie day is coming up. Oh, that's right. It's almost pie day. It's almost pie day. So that's the reason why I picked a pie. And tonight I picked the pina colada cream pie. This is a no-bake pie, so it's quick and easy. For this, you need a graham cracker crust, and you can either make your own with graham cracker crumbs, sugar, and some butter, or you can buy one pre-made at the grocery store. Save yourself a little bit of time. You'll also need some heavy whipping cream, some cream cheese, some granulated sugar, some rum extract, some vanilla extract, some crushed pineapple, and some coconut. You mix all this together and dump it in your pie crust and stick it in the fridge for a bit. And you got a great pie. And continuing with the pie day aspect, my drink corner is the Boston Cream Pie Martini. And for this, you need Irish cream, vanilla vodka, hazelnut liqueur, milk, dark chocolate liqueur, a sprinkle of yellow cake mix powder, and garnish this with some chocolate sauce and a cherry. And of course, all these instructions and ingredients and everything else will be in the show notes. A sprinkle of yellow cake mix powder. People are going to keep cake mix around just to make cocktails with. <laughs> I actually have chocolate and yellow in the cabinet. Well, yeah, but isn't that... Oh, you, okay, I was going to say, but isn't that for making cakes? I guess no, not. It's, it's actually in a baggie, so... Because uh, sometimes you need it, so... Uh, apparently so. I had no idea. I thought pretty people just made cakes. <laughs> no. you got to be creative. <laughs> I suppose. Well, that sounds interesting. Are you going to make me one of those? The Boston Cream Pie Martini? Yeah, yeah. Sure. You'll have to tell me what it's like. <laughs> I gave up booze for Lent, so... Yeah, okay. You're not... Never mind. <laughs> what? I'm not Catholic, no. I, but I still gave it, up, gave it up for Lent, so... So just say so you gave it up. <laughs> just for Lent. Okay. Yeah, right. For, for the duration of Lent, not because of Lent. For the duration of Lent. Of Lent. <laughs> no, yeah. Some <laughs> okay. people, you know, you don't have to be religious to do Lent, so... No, that's true, but you, if you're going to do that, you could just give it up, you know for 
because you want to. Well, there's supposed to be what dry January. Yeah, there's, that there's dry January, and then if you're in in the whiskey tribe, they do a dry week every month. So you know, there's <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I missed the memo on the dry January, so you know, I'm gonna try to make it the 40 days of Lent to Easter. So okay. And then what, binge till you die? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks, <Okay>. though. <laughs> yeah. This is the same person yesterday who said, I'm going to change around my cigar smoking habits. I'm going to only smoke this one type of cigar, except for the ones I get in the cigar club. I said, okay, so how much are those cigars? Oh, they're about $10 a piece. I said, you smoke one a day, so that's $300 a month you're going to spend on cigars. He's like, well, you gave up booze for 40 days. I could probably back off on smoking as many cigars. So what does he do today? He goes out to smoke a cigar, and I was like, yeah, I love your little idea there that just went out the window. And as I told <laughs> you earlier i never said when i was going to start i just said i was going to so. yeah the day you die is when you're going to start yeah, I have i'll definitely feeling. quit that day yeah <laughs> i i assure you i will quit on that day so okay gotcha yeah all the bad habits will be gone <laughs> or something yeah so all right, speaking of bad habits, we're getting into my drink corner. And uh, when I went to go p pull this bottle off the shelf, I hadn't realized that I had never opened it since I bought it. And I'm pretty sure I bought this like a year ago. So let's get into it. I think this one might be of interest to Bill because uh, before he before he started diving into rise and getting uh, super into the rise, he liked weeded whiskeys, and that's what this is. So this is David Nicholson, 1843, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. And uh, it is a weeded whiskey, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in the next paragraph. In 1843, David Nicholson started distilling his original bourbon recipe in the private back room of his St. Louis General Store. For half a century, his recipe had been passed down for generations. Eventually, the legend Julian Pappy Van Winkle and W.L. Weller handcrafted Nicholson's iconic 43 bourbon at the Stitzel Distillery. The Van Winkles owned the brand until 2000 when Luxco acquired it, still possessing the outstanding character for which it earned its original popularity in 1843. The David Nicholson legacy lives on. Aged in new charred oak barrels, this weeded bourbon provides unparalleled smooth flavor and finish. And obviously I did not write that. Someone else did. Uh, but I do have a bottle of David Nicholson's 1843 here from the Luxco distillery. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. The mash bill on it is approximately 70% corn, 20% wheat, and 10% malted barley. I say approximately because the mash bill I found was listed at 68% corn, 20% wheat, and 10% malted barley, which does not add up to 100%. So... 2% magic. <laughs> might be 2% magic. But I assume that 2% was in the corn. It could be 2% in one of the other two categories, but obviously it's not going to matter too much to you because it's going to taste like what it tastes like regardless of what's actually in it. So it doesn't say, don't think it says on the bottle that it's bottled in bond, so it's probably not. However, it is bottled at 100 proof, which is 50%. It comes out of Bardstown, Kentucky now, Lux Roke Distillery. Uh, the color on it is a nice light honey. Uh, there's no age statement, and there was no explicit age in any of the reviews I could find. So I don't know how old it is. But I'm guessing from the taste profile, it's at least three to four years old. It could be older. On the nose, it has a really nice, sweet smell to it. It's mostly honey and butter and vanilla and oak. Uh, and the oak is sort of in the background. Uh, definitely honey, butter, and vanilla. It's very soft and sweet on the nose. And then when you dive into it, it's really nice as well, but uh, weeded whiskeys tend to be a little mellower and have smoother finishes or what people would consider a smoother finish than a standard bourbon because when you take the normal grains out and put wheat in, it sort of has that general effect. But on the taste, you get butterscotch, vanilla, uh, cane sugar, like an un you know like a natural sugar, not a high fructose corn syrup kind of sweet, uh, soft wheat notes and a lightly toasted oak. It's very pleasant on the nose. There's no acerbicness. There's no, uh, you know, medicine-y quality to it at all. It's very nice. It's put together very well. 
And then on the finish, all those sweet flavors kind of stick with you for a while in the tongue and in the throat with a nice creamy buttered toffee. Uh, definitely some of the wheat notes. You can definitely taste that grain over some of the other grains. And a little bit of a kick of like a sweet uh, black pepper or baking spice. Um, not not like a cinnamon or anything like that, but there's definitely a little sort of peppery and uh, like mace or uh, clove kind of hint to it. It's very nice. A uh, very easy drinker, even at 100 proof. Uh, certainly not, you know, higher in the higher echelons of proof in my arsenal here, but uh, definitely way better than something that comes out at 80. So I really like this. It's actually very inexpensive. You can find it for like somewhere between 27 and $30 a bottle for a 750. I was like trying to compare it in my head to other things in my collection, and I almost gave it a 90, but I can't quite give it a 90. It's really good. But it's not quite there, so I had to go with the the next best thing, which is an 89. And for the price point, I mean, it's it's really good. It, it will almost fight toe to toe with the uh, Weller Green Label. So it's definitely a very good Kentucky Straight Bourbon whiskey. And if that sounds like something that you'd be interested in, you know, go ahead and pick something up. I will have to keep my eye open for that. Yeah, that's in- interesting. So what do you got? Anything? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, I'm drinking uh, Costco cheap red wine. So, uh, yeah, that's my uh, that's my evening. So <laughs> just well, it could be yeah. worse. Yeah, I, I do have. a. I mean, I did crack open the bottle of uh, Eagle Rare uh, the other day, but you now everybody knows what that is, what I think about that. So <laughs> I don't need to talk about how amazing it is. And it was uh, the bottles from the uh, it was that single barrel pick, too that uh oh, the store pick yeah the store pick that they had so apparently they must have hid some bottles and then just kind of brought them back out because i ended up with the bottle again i'm like well did i buy this and they ran out and mm, strange mm, interesting <laughs> <laughs> well sometimes they do get more than one store pick you know so oh that's true that's true that could have been could have been but uh yeah anyway it, yeah it's good very good i love it all right fantastic well that's pretty much all we've got we just have the uh, announcements and social media roundup well we don't like guess call it the social media roundup anymore but we do have a couple of announcements uh ham mentions coming up our gofundme is live i've been putting that out everywhere that i can think of if you uh get the link to it please share it and if you don't know what the link is it's lhs.fyi stroke hv2023 it's hotel victor 2023 we really appreciate if anybody can donate or at least share. Um, we have a modest goal of $550 this time, uh, just to cover the, the shortfall in the, our current bank holdings for, uh, for the event. And we look forward to seeing everybody out there. So we really appreciate that. I've uh, had a few announcements from RARS Fest and I've always forgot to put them in the show notes here, but uh, it is coming up on April 8th in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. The RARS Fest has been going for quite a while. They'll be open from 8 to 3 on April 8th. And so if you're uh, in the southeastern United States around that time and you want to check out RARS Fest, uh, please go look them up. A link to the event and where you can get tickets and all that will be in the show notes. And then, of course, don't forget our merchandise stores. We have two of them. We have uh, lhs.fyi slash shop, and that's the one where you can get all the, the drinkware and the USB sticks and, and all that kind of stuff. And then there's lhs.fyi stroke shop 2, which is our selfie store or selfie or however they pronounce it, which is where all the clothing and apparel is, hats and jackets and whatnot. So check those out if you want to support the show that way. We'd really appreciate it. And with that, we're down to our new subscribers, supporters, and live participants. So Cheryl will bring you back in here, and you can read down through the list. Okay, so for this time, we don't have any new subscribers or Patreons. On Facebook, we have Ken Yates. On Twitter, we had at open underscore embed. On YouTube, we had Thomas Stratva and M0FXB. On the mailing list, Corner 5 joined us. There are no merchandise sales. This week on Discord, we had Alan Lissler, Thundar, Captain Jimmy, Curtis, N5BIG. And on the live chat, we had Ted, WA0EIR, Stacy, KB7YS, Winston, KD2WLL, and Darren, VK6EK. All right. Well, thanks very much for that. And thanks, everybody, for listening, whether to the live show or to the recorded version. We appreciate it. And stay tuned, obviously, because it's our 500th episode. The giveaway information will be come out really, really soon. And uh, we'll let you know what we're giving away and how you can get an entry into that giveaway so you can take home 
a nice piece of kit and it will be on all the social media networks and our web page and all the places where we post up, including the mailing list. So stay tuned for that. We hope to see you all at Hamvention. And with that, let's go ahead and get on out of here and let you get along with the rest of your day. And we'll say toodaloo from episode number 499, The Weekender of Linux in the Hamshack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, N4RD, 73. Thank you for listening to this episode of Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a community-sponsored podcast. Our website is located at lhspodcast.info. You can support the podcast by visiting the LHS Patreon page at patreon.com stroke LHS podcast or by using the contribute list on the homepage. We have a presence on Discord, Facebook, IRC, Twitter and YouTube. You can also drop us an email at info at lhspodcast.info or leave us a voicemail at 1-909-LHS-SHOW. That's 1-909-547-7469. Visit the online LHS merchandise store at shop.lhspodcast.info for fun and fashionable show-themed merchandise. Until next time, remember to always heed your hedonism. (laughs) 